Um, he's an internationally recognized thought leader known as a disaster avoidance expert. Dr. Gleb is on a mission to protect leaders from the dangerous judgment errors known as cognitive biases. He does so by using a combination of his pragmatic business experience and cutting edge neuroscience and behavioral economics research to develop the most effective strategies for making decisions, managing risk, developing strategic plans, and avoiding business disasters. A best-selling author of several traditionally published books, Dr. Gleb is both best known for his Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, published by Career Press. His newest book, published by Changemakers Books, is Resilience, Adapted, and a Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. His groundbreaking thought leadership was featured in over 515 articles and 450 interviews in prominent venues. These include Time Incorporated Magazine, CBS News, Business Leaders Insider, The Chronicle of Philanthropy, CNBC, and Fast Company. Dr. Gleb's expertise will com comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, speaking, and training experience as CEO of disaster avoidance experts. His clients include innovative startups, large nonprofits, and Fortune 500 companies such as Affleck, Honda, Wells Fargo, the World Wildlife Fund, and Xerox. His expertise also comes from his research background as a cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral econom economist. He spent over 15 years in higher education, including seven as a professor at Ohio State University, where he published dozens of peer-reviewed articles. In his free time, he makes sure to spend an abundant quality of time with his wife to avoid disasters in his personal life. My husband could take a lesson from that. To help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked him to share with us about thriving in the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery via neuroscience and behavioral economic for finance officers. So welcome everybody and thank you, Dr. Gleb, and I will let you take over the floor. Thank you very much, Debbie. I really appreciate that kind introduction. And I know the folks here are governmental finance officers. So I've worked a number with a number of government branches I published in Government Executive a number of times. I've worked for a number of city and state government activities, mostly in Columbus, in Ohio. So I'm based in Ohio, so I've worked with the Columbus city government. I've worked with the Ohio state government. I'm quite familiar with government work and how it's impacted by COVID-19. I've helped governments cope with it. And that is something that we'll be talking about throughout the presentation, especially in the Q&A. So I'll be giving broad pragmatic strategies that are applicable to everyone. And I don't want to get too much into the politics of it. Of course, government officers, we talk about politics as they're relevant. So if you want to bring that up in the Q&A, we can. But we'll talk about, I'll be more focused on business and the business end of things, which of course includes government business. So I want to start by how so many people in government and elsewhere underestimated COVID-19. And I'll be focusing about business because it's less controversial than government. So consider Elon Musk, very prominent business leader. A lot of people listen to him, including, of course, some of the younger government officials who are forward-looking progressive in the, not the liberal sense, but forward-looking sense, very digitally oriented. So he tweeted on March 6th that the coronavirus panic is dumb, just as the coronavirus pandemic was taking root here in the US. And he's very popular, has a huge following. So you see that got 1.75 million likes and nearly 350,000 retweets. And then just a couple of weeks later, after the declaration of the pandemic as a national emergency here in the US, he tweeted that based on current trends, probably close to zero new cases in the US too by the end of April. Well, we have over 5 million cases and about 200,000 people who died of COVID-19. So over 180,000 people coming close to 200,000. will be probably there unfortunately by the end of September. So that is clearly off, clearly wrong. And a number of people who follow him, listen to him, made bad mistakes. But that's kind of new money, entrepreneurial, progressive, younger people. What about older people, old money, really financially oriented savvy folks, like Goldman Sachs. What did they say about COVID-19? Well, they, they of course make estimates of US GDP growth was one of the primary 
activities that they do to set guidance for the client. So on February 24th, they made an estimate that the U.S. would have 2.7% GDP growth, and that was after the COVID-19 was taking root in Italy, so it was clearly becoming a problem. So they, it was below their previous estimate. Then just a couple of weeks later, on March 15th, they revised their estimate to say that it's not going to be 2.7% growth, it's going to be a 5% decline. 5% decline, that's very bad. I mean, as finance officers, you know how bad that is to have that sort of mistake, 7.7% mistake, really bad. But just a few days later, on March 20th, they changed their prediction. They said it won't be a 5% decline, it'll be a 24% decline. Clearly, they didn't know what they're doing. Going five days later, going from 5% decline, 24% decline, 19% difference. Yeah, not really knowing what they're doing. And it ended up, they were wrong in all of these estimates. It ended up being an over 32% decline in US GDP growth. So very, very bad situation. Most, as a result, were unprepared. Whether we're talking about government, we're talking about companies, all sorts of entities were unprepared. They leader, the leaders of various sorts underestimated the threat. They were caught in a bad situation. So they turned to their emergency business continuity plan, as I'm sure that many folks did who are here on the presentation. But these plans are a bad fit for the situation. And as a, the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, I've done a lot of business continuity plans. I can tell you they're not a good fit for this situation. Why? Well, because they're great for emergencies. When there's a blizzard and there's an interruption of service for one week, two weeks, or something like that, or maybe a flood, major flood when that happens, or something like that. But COVID-19 is not that. It's not an emergency. It's a major disruptor. It's a huge major disruptor. It's a slow-moving, high-impact, long-term event. So you can't treat it as a sprint. It's a marathon, and that's how you need to treat it. Relying on business continuity plans that are meant for short-term intense emergencies leads to serious problems. This is not a good way to approach COVID-19. We'll talk about how to approach it later, but more effectively. But before we talk about that, we need to understand, and you've probably heard this before, but let me make sure that I underline that the vaccine is the only effective solution. In human trials for a vaccine need to test their safety and effectiveness. They're estimated to take at least a year. And they started for the earliest candidate, the Moderna vaccine, in March of this year. So they will, and Pfizer started in the summer, so in well, late, well, late spring, summer. So as opposed to the usual four to five years. Usually it takes four to five years. And that vaccine trials, if we throw all the money at it that we can, and we cut all the red tape that we can, that's going to take at least a year, at least a year for the trials, because you need to test their safety, how safe they are. And the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines so far look a little bit iffy on the safety, kind of many more side effects, at least so far that we found than the typical vaccines that we have for, let's say, the cold, the flu, I'm sorry. So the flu vaccine has many less side effects. And we need to test whether the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine are actually safe enough to use. And of course, their effectiveness. We have no idea whether they're effective. We know they're effective in creating an immune response, but we don't know whether this immune response will prevent COVID-19 because that's not something we know. So we need to test that out and that will take a long time to test out. And these vaccines were rushed into production. Notoriously, most vaccines, most of the early wave of vaccines don't make it through human trials, especially ones that were rushed into production. For example, just about two months ago, there was a new strain of COVID 19 discovered that's actually more infectious than the original strain and now it has become more widespread throughout the world, including in the US. And the vaccines that Moderna and Pfizer created and so many other early first wave vaccines is meant to target the original strain that's been spreading in Wuhan, China. And we have no idea whether these new vaccines will whether these vaccines will be effective against new strain. Maybe they'll just produce the immunity response against the old strain. We have no idea. So that is why we, this is one of many, many factors which causes or the early wave of vaccines in general historically to fail. So it's likely, given the historical tendency and the fact that the vaccines were rushed into production, that the first trials will not be successful. It's very unlikely that the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine 
will succeed. I would give it a very low probability. Then, after the vaccine is ready, government needs to coordinate the process of producing it, distributing it, vaccinating people. The Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, one of the big challenges with their production is they're based on a new technology, previously untested, RNA vaccine nation. So it will be much harder to produce it than previous vaccines. And then distributing it is going to be really hard because they need to be stored at least minus 20 Celsius of minus four Fahrenheit. So the Pfizer one is minus uh, something like 70 Celsius and the Moderna is minus 20 Celsius. That's not something that most doctor's offices and pharmacies are equipped to handle. It's kind of a hospital level of technology. So that's going to be very hard to distribute it. And then vaccination. You need to convince a lot of reluctant people. We have you know, only about maybe two thirds of the population, maybe 60%. So 70% who are ready and willing to take a vaccine, and that's before they heard about all the negative side effects. So there'll be a need to make major, major public education campaign. I would say that even with a solid level of competence shown by the federal government, and of course this is a federal government task, this would take at least a year. And this is not something that the federal government has shown much competence in, in terms of taking leadership over COVID-19 response so far. So this is unfortunate. And this leads me to believe that the most optimistic timeline was not very likely. More like, much more likely is a moderate timeline. And there's some likelihood of a pessimistic timeline. So let's look at these timelines, just so we know what we're dealing with and that so US finance officers know what to budget for. The optimistic timeline, one of the first vaccines is effective. Let's say the Moderna is effective or the Pfizer of its effective. So it will be approved sometime by summer 2021. If the Moderna is effective, it will probably be approved by mid-spring, if Pfizer more like late spring. So by summer 2021, maybe one of the other uh, vaccines, the Estratec vaccine in, in the UK. Then the production, distribution, vaccination, let's say everything goes smoothly, perfectly, wonderfully, and we solve all the problems. will take only six months, only six months. This is a wonderful, very unrealistic scenario. So have most people vaccinated by early 2022. This is a super optimistic, very low reality scenario. I would give it no more than 25% at the outside probability, unfortunately. Much more likely is a moderate scenario. So in this scenario, the first wave of vaccines doesn't work because they were rushed into production and or had too many safety issues. So you have to go to the second wave or the third wave of vaccines. So instead of being approved by 2021, mid 2021, they'd be approved by 2023, sometime 22, 23, 24, with a midpoint of 23. And then production, distribution, vaccination at a moderate level of competence, more than has been shown so far by federal government, will take about a year. So moderate, good level of competence. Then most people will be vaccinated by 2024, by the start of 2024. So that is the most likely scenario, ranging from 20, you know, late 2022 to late 2025. That's 50%. This, this range, late 2022 to late 2025, to late 2026, with a midpoint of 2024. So that is the most likely scenario, 50% probability. But we can also get unlucky. The universe can show us the middle finger. It will be approved for mass production by 2026. That's going to be if the vaccine is harder to develop than we think. And one of the first, second wave, third wave of vaccines doesn't produce an effective vaccine that has over 80% effectiveness. So it's kind of an effective vaccine. We, doesn't, we don't get that until 2026, which is really where, where we need to get to address COVID-19, something like 80% effectiveness. It will help if we have something like 50 or 60, but that will not end the pandemic. We need, because you know, half the people getting sick with COVID-19, you know, half the numbers, 100,000 people dead by now, rather than or 90 something thousand people dead by now, rather than 180,000 will still be horrible and terrible, and it will still cause a lot of fear. So it will not end the pandemic. So production, distribution, vaccination, moderate level of competence, a year, most people will be vaccinated by 2027. So that is the other scenario. That is a pessimistic scenario, but it's 25% probability because, you know, we still haven't found an effective vaccine for the flu. And it's been, we've been trying to get that for over a century. So this is where we are right now. This is the reality that we're facing. And we have to realize that this is an unpleasant reality, but we have to also understand that we need to 
face it truly head on if we want to make good decisions about COVID-19, good plans around COVID-19. All right, so I want to strongly encourage you to understand that well, this is not easy to hear. I mean, this is just not easy to hear. I, we, I, <laughs> it's hard for me to talk about this. It's painful for me as well. I struggle with it too. When I first started looking at this as a disaster avoidance expert, you know, risk management, disaster avoidance, that's strategic planning, that's my expertise. So I started looking at this when it was coming out in late December, early January, and I started figuring out this information and planning out the timelines. I saw that you know, it's just astounding how badly so many leaders responded to it. And so I started publishing articles about it in March 20, in or late February, March of this year, started writing it, they were accepted for publication in early March. Then based on that, I started writing a book and my pub publisher approached me to write a book. I wrote a book about this. So I was talking about this much earlier than most people. And it was very painful for me and for my clients, the people who are, I was directly working with. I did, already did nine strategic pivots, consulting project pivots for a number of clients, including government agencies on how to address COVID-19, change their strategy to address COVID-19. And what I helped them accept it and me accept it is that the sooner we come to accept it, the more we are capable of addressing COVID-19 effectively. So here's the future. Here's what we're facing until widespread vaccination, sometime until 23, 24, 25. We have looser restrictions, which a number of states loosen the restrictions too early, unfortunately. But in general, we have loosened restrictions and an increase in cases. Sometimes very sharp, unfortunately, as happened in Florida, Texas, or Arizona. Then we have tighter restrictions and decrease in cases. So that's what's going to happen. We'll have these waves, repeating waves of this dynamic, various levels of social distancing and shutdowns until a vaccine becomes widely available. The world will change forever. Even in the most optimistic, optimistic, optimistic case of this being over by early 2022, we still these waves of restrictions and fears will change people's habits, norms, values, preferences, desires. We'll never go back to that halcyon, idyllic time before COVID-19. We'll never go back to January 2020. So we need to accept this. We need to let go of that time and realize we're in a new abnormal and we need to live life as it is. And your role is a trusted advisor, as a financial officer. Your role is as a trusted advisor. So you need to be a trusted advisor to various leaders and influence them. You're a leader yourself, but you also need to be a trusted advisor. You need to empower these leaders to realize the extent of this major disruption. Finance officers tend to be pragmatic, clear-eyed. Many government officers are not. They tend to be way too optimistic, especially the political ones. So you need to help them prepare for this really uncomfortable reality. And you need to prepare your own budgets for this uncomfortable reality. By helping them accept this information, you'll help them accomplish their leadership goals and your own leadership goals and build up trust in yourself as a trusted advisor. I want to encourage you to not plan for the optimistic scenario as part of doing so. Too many companies, too many leaders act as though the problem will blow over soon. But you want to remember this great phrase attributed to Vince Lombardi, famous football coach, that hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. Remember that hope is not a strategy. You want to prepare for the moderate or pessimistic scenario, not for the optimistic one. The pandemic is a slow moving threat. And here we need to understand that we as human beings make very bad decisions about such threats because that's not what our brain is wired for. Our brain is not wired to deal with such threats. They're very unusual and by definition, slow moving, high impact threats. We underestimate such threats, both their likelihood and their impact. And this leads to decisions that endanger our business plans endanger our businesses, our organizations of all sorts. And this, we get a lot of bad advice about this. And we fall into dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases. I have a lot, a lot of expertise in cognitive biases. So you'll see in my writings, I talk about this a lot. These dangerous judgment errors come from our evolutionary background and how our brains are wired. So in our evolutionary background, we have to understand that our brains, our gut reactions, our instincts, are wired not for the modern environment. It's only been around since World War II. That's where it's been around. But our gut reactions are wired for the savanna environment. When we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people, 
were hunters, foragers, and gatherers. That's what we're wired for, this tribalism, this in, these instincts. We're not wired for the kind of threats we face in the modern world. Our primary response to threats, even now, is the fight or flight response. It was great for hunter-gatherers. It was life-saving for them. But the risks they faced were different from ours. They faced immediate, intense, in-the-moment threats, saber-toothed tigers. You might have heard of this as the saber-toothed tiger response, where you had to jump at a hundred shadows to get away from that one saber-toothed tiger. But it's dangerous, positively dangerous in today's world, because the risks we face are much more long-term, uncertain, ambiguous. They might come from having a housing bubble built up in a way that we don't notice and real, realize that until it comes crashing down and we get to 2008-2009 fiscal crisis, or disease that became in the middle of China and that, you know, Wuhan, China, who knew this would be such a problem for the U.S.? And the, that's kind of the notifications you get on your smartphone about this, an article someone forwards you about the disease is the kind of threats that we face in today's world. And there are specifically three of these dangerous judgment errors, cognitive biases, that cause us to make bad decisions about COVID-19. The normalcy bias, the planning fallacy, and hyperbolic discounting. I'll go through each of these in turn. The normalcy bias. In the Savannah environment, we did not have many changes. We could easily predict the short-term future by the short-term past. We can assume that everything keeps going normally. That's the Savannah environment. Now, the only changes would be changes of the season, spring, summer, fall, winter. This is not the modern world. This is not the way we live. Whether it's the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis, I mean, that was a huge impact. What about the smartphone, the invention of the smartphone? Huge impacts from technology. And of course, the, this, this global pandemic, huge impact. And we are underestimating it. We don't really un think about all the impacts, all the consequences for it. The likelihood of the impact, that's something we greatly underestimate. And we rush to go back to normal. We want to go back to normal. We want to go back to, to that world of January 2020. And so we act as though everything is normal. Again, we are very tempted to act as though everything is normal, even though it's not. And we greatly underestimate the impact of COVID-19, as well as more generally the likelihood of such major disasters, slow-moving, high-impact, long-term ones. The planning fallacy. This is a major one where we tend to assume that the future will go according to plan. So for we make a budget plan or we make a strategic plan, and it's very tempting for us to assume that everything will keep going according to this plan. It's just intuitive. It feels good to assume that because we're confident about ourselves and our planning. And so that leads us to underestimate a lot of risks, a lot of threats that might come up like COVID-19 or the fiscal crisis of 2008, 2009, or so many other threats, so many other problems. We underestimate the resources we need to address such problems. Time, money, information, social capital, strategic planning resources, all of these things are things we underestimate. And finally, hyperbolic discounting. In the Savannah environment, it was a safe bet that you want to play for today, not tomorrow. You want to focus on today because you can't really save resources for tomorrow. So we pretend to still perceive the short-term future as much more important than the long-term future. But in the modern world, that's not the case. You know, we can save resources for the future. We can put money in a bank. We can make plans for our organization. We can invest into the future. But we underestimate the importance of the long-term future. So we prioritize the short-term and harm the long-term and we underestimate the long-term impacts and outcomes of major crises like COVID-19 and how we deal with them. All right, so at this point, we're gonna to go to the first poll. So remember, you need to go through the polls and answer all of them, all the polls thoroughly in order to get credit for this presentation. So first poll, which of these cognitive biases is most dangerous for your organization? You will see in Zoom this poll, so and you will be able to vote on it. So please vote. Again, you need to vote. This is just part of getting your CPEs, your credits. Which of these cognitive biases is most dangerous for your organization? I see about 76% of the people voted. 
and spend 30 seconds. I'll give 50, people 15 more seconds. And remember, everyone needs to vote. Everyone who wants to get credit needs to vote. So if you don't want credit, don't need to vote. So we have 37 people who voted. Give five more seconds. 38 out of 42 people voted. I assume the rest are not interested in credits. All right, so let's see, which ones are the biggest problems according to you? The normalcy bias seems to be the biggest for about just under half of the people. So normalcy bias, it's good that you realize that. So you wanna be thinking about for those for whom that, see that as the biggest problem, you want to go back to your organization and make sure that you address that, integrate that knowledge into your organization. The same thing for those who see the planning fallacy is the biggest problem, just under 30%, and just about a quarter do so for hyperbolic discounting. So in all cases, whatever you see as the biggest problem, you want to go back and bring this information to your organization and address it effectively. And of course, bring information about others as well to the extent that you see them as a problem. Great. So let's talk a little bit about how you can prepare. How you can prepare effectively to deal with COVID-19, its consequences, and then the post-COVID recovery, which will not be, which in some ways will be taking place as COVID-19 is still here, the economic recovery, which of course the finance officer is really concerned about that, that will be taking place as we're ongoing, but while COVID is still here, it will be far from a full recovery. So that's a big, big concern. You want to make long-term changes to your plan. Think years, not months long-term changes. You will really want to revisit your strategic plan. Of course, I'm confident that you should hopefully have a strategic plan for your organization, government organization going forward, and you want to revisit that plan and make long-term changes. But I can't tell you the number of times when I was contacted by people to do strategic planning, and they told me that they're treating COVID-19 as a day-to-day -day issue rather than a long-term strategic issue. And that's a big, big mistake. And worked hard to talk them out of it. I wasn't successful in all cases, but I, um, in about, I think, two thirds of the cases, I was successful in really getting them to treat COVID-19 as a strategic issue. That one third of the cases did not become my clients because I don't work with people who are unwilling to accept coaching and feedback that's a really strategic feedback. That's not gonna be a good collaboration. So how can you prepare? You want to focus on fundamental changes to your organizational model. I'll talk about what that is. For the next several years, you want to focus much more on virtual interactions and financial pay. Government budgets will be very, very difficult to deal with, much more painful than previous years. And this pain will be ongoing for much longer than people tend to anticipate. I mean, how many of you have planned for 2024 as the mid midpoint of when things will be over? So you want to make a commitment to virtual teams as much as possible. It's uncomfortable, it's hard. Many people want to go back to the office and open things up, but this is not a good idea. This is a long-term disruption. So many people are just gonna be so much better off if you have virtual teams. And then of course you can save a lot of money by ending office space lease, selling some buildings. So this is, some, this is an area where you don't simply have to have spend or cut money on staff, you can spend that you can invest into cutting money on staff, on uh, cutting money on office space, and then investing that into virtual transitions, and you'll save quite a bit of money. So in your internal organizational model, there are six areas you want to be looking at, at addressing. This is, of course, as finance officers, the main things you'll be looking at, your internal organizational model. What do you change? How can you change things? These are the six areas, internal controls, motivation, engagement, communication, resolving conflicts, cultivating trust, and accountability. I'll go through each in turn. So internal controls. Of course, as finance officers, that's a big concern. So you want to ensure financial security. That's the top concern. There's ensuring financial security is really important and doing it virtually will be different. So I recommend that you keep one or two people in the office at all times to manage checks coming in, ensure financial security, but you can downsize your office to as much as 90% of your office. I've had clients, I mean, I've had clients going to all virtual, but that's less realistic for government organizations. So you can do 10% of your previous office space and then handle checks, finances there, and you can ensure financial security. 
by virtual transactions, but that's something you need to deliberately invest in, ensuring financial security. And as part of that, prevent cybersecurity vulnerabilities. The FBI has been reporting a lot, lot more hacking because people who are including finance folks, when they're working at home, they're not used to following all the cybersecurity protocols that they're used to following in the office. And their home setup is not nearly as good or hardened as it was before. I had, I had an executive, finance executive, who actually, um, an older gentleman, who when he couldn't log on to his virtual desktop at work, turned off his firewall in order to log on. That is not a good idea, but that happens regularly, these sorts of things. And this executive should have known better. But all the gentlemen didn't really know how to do things and wasn't trained especially effectively. And that's something you need to address. You want to look at your existing compliance practices. You have a lot of compliance practices as government finance officers, and you want to adapt them to the current reality, to virtual interactions. And pursue compliance with CDC guidelines to the extent that you have in office interactions. And revise your internal measurements of effectiveness and efficiency. These will be different in the pandemic. So flux time and so on. You'll want to treat you want to treat people's activities more project based than time based because there'll be much more flex time. There'll be much more interrupted at home. So that's something for you to be thinking about how to do revise internal measurements. Talk about that in the Q and A. Motivation engagement. Already before the pandemic, we had problems, serious problems of motivation engagement. Only 34% of all employees were fully engaged, which means willing to sacrifice for the cause for the organization, willing to stay late, being creative, problem solving. Most people, about 60%, just under 60% were punching the clock. They were just coming in, doing the minimal amount possible to get by, ready to leave for another opportunity if one presented itself, but not actively looking for one. And about 10% were actively disengaged, meaning hostile to their workplace, leaving for a new opportunity, ready to steal, by the way, unfortunate, but that's the case. Working from home presents many more problems. So you'll have a lack of motivation from being near other employees. There are things that working with other employees, a lot of people, uh, pretty much at all of the strategic retreats I did to pivot for COVID-19, people reported that was nine. People reported that they were feeling Zoom fatigue, burnout. That's not really what they're feeling or not only what they're feeling. The problem is when you're not working with your colleagues is you feel a sense of deprivation in a way that you don't realize. We get a lot of our meaning and purpose and fulfillment from interactions in the workplace, from ways that, in ways that we don't realize, this tribal environment. And people don't realize they're missing that and they, that's something they need to address and replace. But if they don't realize it, then they're just interpreting it as work from home fatigue or Zoom fatigue. And that's not really what it is. So that's something you need to address. Then there's the stress of adjusting to the personal life and household to the pandemic, whether kids not going to work, taking care of elderly parents who you're afraid to see and hug in person because given COVID, given the pre-symptomatic conditions. You want to provide support and guidance and professional development to your employees on all of these areas. We can talk about what that means in the Q&A. Next. Effective communication. It's notoriously difficult to communicate effectively even face-to-face. -face. I'm sure you've gotten training on that effective communication. But it's even more difficult to do virtual communication, especially if you're used to in-person communication. You're switching all to text. That is much more of our, your communication. Whether you're doing Microsoft Teams, Slack, Trello, various collaboration platforms. I hope you're using collaboration platform and not all email, which is much worse. But overwhelmingly our communication is taking place by text. And when it's taking place by text, we lose so much. We have so many more understandings. When I say, I think Mary should take the project, or I think Mary should take that project, those two sentences mean different things because of my tone of voice. But when I write them down, they mean the same thing. And you also lose nuance in, in not only tone of voice, but body gestures, expressions, we lose a lot of that, and that's a problem. And that's something you need to give people professional development and effective communication in virtual teams. A related problem is resolving conflicts in other areas of effective collaboration. In face-to-face -face interactions, you can notice people having problems. You can notice issues. You can notice tensions, anxiety, stress, surprise. All of these sorts of things are things you can notice when you're communicating face-to-face -face and then address the problem as it comes up. But you can't do it much, you can't do it effectively if you can't notice the problem. 
and especially if you don't have effective communication. In a virtual team, it's much easier for these problems to not be noticed. So this is another area where it's really important to offer professional development. Cultivating trust. This is a natural thing to do in the office. We just get together for a cup of coffee in the break room and talk about your kids, your vacation plans, local football team and how it's doing, all of that sort of stuff. You know, Washington Redskins, all of that. It's something that people can be passionate about. But in virtual settings, it doesn't happen naturally. Oh no, not the Redskins, the Washington blank. So we'll see what their name. It doesn't happen naturally. This is not a matter of training. So this is not a matter of training. This is a virtual venue that needs to be created for this. This is so, uh, unlike some of the other points, this is a virtual venue point. I can talk about what that means in the Q&A. And then finally, accountability. Accountability, accountability. And accountability is much easier in the office. You can walk around, see what other people are doing, see what, the, um, see what employees, supervisor can walk around, see how employees are doing, check in with them, make sure to hold them accountable. And you can hold people accountable. You can pop into Mary's office and say, hey, Mary, where's that report you promised me yesterday? So there's peer-to-peer -peer accountability. So it's much easier to ignore a Slack message than to ignore you standing, for Mary to ignore a Slack message than for Mary to ignore you standing right there in her office door. So you need to create new structures for accountability, both chain up the chain of command management accountability and peer-to-peer -peer accountability. So those are the six areas of internal organizational model that you really need to address if you want to succeed with the COVID-19 and make and successfully adapt to the current situation and the post-COVID recovery. So be prepared for the post-COVID recovery, which will not come until post-COVID, post-health recovery. That will come you know, 23, 24, 25, most likely. But the economic recovery is starting to take place. We don't know yet what kind of recovery it will be. It looks, it's most likely going to be a K-shaped recovery. And that means that some areas will do well, most areas will not. So a lot of people will be fired in the next couple of months, unfortunately, as the PPP protections uh, run out for their employment. And that will mean a lot less money for government coffers as well. So this is something you need to be really seriously thinking about. Government will not be one of the areas that will do well. There will be technology, some other areas will do well. Unfortunately, government won't. So you'll be experiencing a lot more pain than some other in, in areas of business. So you want to plan for the long-term impact of the pandemic. And this is something you need to be thinking about. There are six things that you need to be doing. You need to be thinking about the possible futures. What are the possible futures? And of course, we talked about how you have the optimistic one, vaccine of widely available by 2022, very unrealistic. Moderate one, much more realistic, vaccine widely available by 2024, and then pessimistic, still quite possible, oh, available by 2027. And you want to invest your resources accordingly. So make a plan for that future. Before we go on and I talk about the possible futures, I want to take another poll. So make sure to that you do a poll if you want to get the CPE credits. So again, think about your organizational model and its adaptation to the pandemic. How well adapted is your organizational model to the pandemic? Please vote. It's perfectly adapted. We need moderate revisions or we need serious revisions. So please vote. All right, I see more than half the people voted. Great. Voting faster than last time. Okay, 40 people voted. I'll give people five more seconds to vote. All right, you should be able to see the results. So just 5% of the people, for 5%, you're perfectly well adapted, that's great for you. 95% are not, that's unfortunate, but that's the reality. So for two thirds of you or so, you need moderate revisions. So you need to realize, think about what are the moderate revisions that you need to take place in all the six areas that I talked about and implement those revisions. For those who need serious changes, that's really like a, a super priority. You wanna be looking at those six areas and thinking thoroughly about how you need to change each of those areas or if each of those areas applies. So you need to be really seriously thinking about major changes to your structure if you want to really succeed in our not that great future. Unfortunately, it's bad news, but that's what we need to realize and adapt to. So talking about these futures, 
when you think about these futures, you want to be thinking about five years out. And we talked about what are the potential futures five years out. Imagine what business would look like, what your coffers would look like as government finance officers in five years in each of the three scenarios, the optimistic, the moderate, pessimistic. The optimistic, widely vaccine widely available by 2022, so we have a complex recovery, probably K-shaped until then, and then things are gonna go back to slowly, but surely other industries will start looking up. The government is not going to be looking up until COVID is over. It's just not, this is the reality of the situation. That is one, and that's very optimistic, very unlikely. The moderates, uh, so only 25% chance. 75% chance encompasses the moderate and the pessimistic one. And, you know, while you can hope for the best, you really want to prepare for the worst. You can certainly, that's, you know, hope for the best, plan for the worst, right? The moderate scenario, 2024. So you're looking at four years of pretty serious pain. Pretty serious pain for your budgets. Very serious situation, or three and a half years really serious economic troubles. And then slow recoveries going up, following someone. Again, government will not be a leading indicator. Now you'll have restaurants opening up. Oh, that's current. That's, a lot of restaurants will go out of business. Let's just be honest. I mean, a number of restaurants that have indoor dining right now, they will not be able to have it in the, in the, fall, in, in the fall because COVID-19 will become worse because it spreads more easily in the fall. So a lot of places will close, will be in a lot of trouble, and and restaurants are just an example. Bars, other you know, you know other sorts of indoor entertainment venues. So everything from indoor gyms, so gyms and so on, you know, all of those things will not be in a good situation. Pool halls not be in a good situation. It's 2024, and the pessimistic 2027. We won't be that. That will be very tough, and that what the five years uh, prognosis looks like for that pessimistic scenario. It's possible, it's not too likely, 25%, but it's still possible. But you have 75% that it will be at least either the moderate or the pessimistic one. Think about the problems. What kind of problems will you face in these sorts of scenarios? A lot of financial pain, a lot of financial struggle, a lot of turmoil. Think of ways that you can address them in advance. The earlier you make the cuts that you need to make, that U.S. finance officers realize you need to make the right now the less cuts you'll need to make later. This will be much better for you going forward. Or make a plan to resolve these problems if they do occur. Then opportunities. Think about opportunities. List possible opportunities in each scenario. So for example, if you can replace, automate some of the functions that are currently part of what you do. So if you can think about automating them, making them virtual anyway, you certainly want to move to that. But a lot of functions can be automated, and there are a lot of services that provide automation of functions. And these function automation may not make too much sense in the one or two year scenario, but given that it'll be a three, four, five year, six year scenario with COVID, they might make well make a lot of sense and save you quite a bit of money over that time period. So think about a lot of automation activities, and this is ways of bringing about these opportunities. Or make a plan to seize the, the opportunities if they do occur. Think about the resources you need. And I talked about money in each of these scenarios, time, information, social capital, strategic planning. When you talked about you know, the well, over a quarter of you who want to do serious revisions in your organization, that needs to be strategically planned. You need to think about strategically what will be the revisions, how they'll impact your strategy going forward, have a vision of yourself in that five years, and then work backward from that to see the kind of revisions that you need to make to your structure in order to succeed in five years from now. That's what strategic revisions to your structure means. And the same thing for moderate revisions. You want to look at five years from now and the kind of moderate revisions that you need to succeed in that five years. Make a plan to reserve sufficient resources. For the pessimistic scenario, I strongly encourage that at least the moderate scenario, but ideally the, optimi ideally the pessimistic one. Don't plan for the moderate one, uh, for the optimistic one. I strongly encourage you to plan for the Moderate if you don't have the resources, ideally the pessimistic, definitely not the optimistic scenario. And think about information. What kind of information would you use to assess which of these scenarios is taking place? And monitor this information closely. For example, the CDC or the National Institute of Health, those are venues that you can look to. Bill Gates is a very prominent philanthropist who is not making any money from vaccines, pouring a lot of his wealth into vaccines, and he's really trying to 
be clear-eyed about the reality of the situation. So he himself is saying the most optimistic case is what I'm saying. So adjust your plans accordingly and then execute, execute, execute. All right, so last poll. How well fit is your current strategic plan to thriving in the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery? Please vote. How, how well suited is your current strategic plan to thriving in the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery? Go ahead, please vote. You know, about 50% of the people voted. Eighty-three percent of the people voted. So we have ninety percent of the people. I'll give people ten more seconds. Ten more seconds to vote. All right. Okay. So about five percent of you see your current strategic plan as a great fit. It's probably the same people who see their current organizational structure as a great fit. Great to hear that. Just under two thirds see the need to make moderate changes to your strategic plan. So good. So look at your strategic plan, uh, look at the strategies that I suggested for revising it and make those moderate changes for that five year outlook from moderate or pessimistic, that's what I strongly encourage. And finally, about just the over 30% see the need to make serious revisions. I'm glad that you see that. And that's something for you to bring to your leadership as a very immediate kind of thing because the earlier you make these changes, this applies to the moderate one, but especially the serious revisions. The earlier you make these revisions, the less pain you will suffer in the long term. So the earlier you make the revisions, the less pain you will have. All right. So that's the last thing I want to share with you. You'll see additional resources involve a free coaching session with me to talk about integrating these into your organization. And a free digital copy of my new book, Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. And I'll send that by email. So don't worry about, you don't need to do anything, but those are going to be the additional resources you get as a way of integrating this information into your organization. All right, everyone. So this is what I want to share with you. And at this point, I'll be happy to take questions. You can unmute yourself if you wish. We don't have that large of a crowd, so I'm not too worried about it or you can ask questions in the chat. Either way is fine. Happy to take questions. Okay, everybody, don't be afraid. Bring your questions forward. This is your opportunity. It was excellent presentation, Dr. Gleb. Um, little depressing but very enlightening and, and thinking out long term is is a struggle and that's I think what we're all struggling with. Yeah thank you very much Debbie yes this is definitely I really appreciate your kind words about the presentation it is definitely depressing and I myself was depressed when I uh, learned about this information it was you know I had for me when I feel depressed I feel fatigued and that is just the physical manifestation of my state of low energy and mood and in February and March when I was really internalizing this information and looking at the long-term outlook I was definitely struggling with a mild depression myself so this is not great but it's very important to have that long-term perspective and realize what is actually going to be the long-term consequences of what we're difficult to deal with all right I've got let's, a question. let's see for people so a number of people ask questions in the Q&A Oh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Camille, did you have a question? Please go uh, ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if you've got an idea about which sectors of the economy are going to be hit hardest. I see, you know, you, you say that, you know, technology is, is probably going to do well, but I'm wondering about property values. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know that uh, sales, sales taxes have gone down um, yes. and, and maybe for some perspective, a comparison with our, our most recent that um, uh, recession that we had back in 2009, 2011. Mm -hmm. do, do you have any comparison there or something you can say about that? 
Yes. So I'll talk about property values first and other, other industries. Property values, what you're going to see happen is in the short and medium term, private housing is going to go up because people, a lot of people need to change their homes because they're doing a lot more virtual work. So there's going to be a lot more demand for homes. And in the short and medium term, for the next year or so, I would say, they would go up. But as especially if the scenario is that COVID-19, we don't have an immediate effective vaccine, which is very unlikely, what we're going to see is that we're already seeing, just to be clear, a high increase in mortgage default rates. So mortgage default rates are shooting up right now. And as people will be fired in the next two months, as the PPP protections wear out, so we already see a lot of people being fired in advance. So companies saying that everyone from resorts to airlines are laying off many, many thousands of people. And so those people will be losing their homes. I mean, many of them won't, won't be able to find a job. So this is just the reality of the situation. So in about, I would say, six months to a year, probably closer to a year, you're going to have housing prices going down because of these mortgage issues, especially if you don't find a short-term vaccine for COVID-19. And the, so that's one dynamic. The other dynamic is commercial real estate. Commercial real estate is already going down because a lot of companies are saying, hey, we're not going back to the office. And this is not only technology companies, there's a lot of traditional companies like, let's say Nationwide Insurance, Columbus, Ohio, so it's right where I am. They have decided to shift a number of their employees permanently to working at home. So they don't need as much office space and they will be downsizing their office space, and they are. And commercial real estate is not going to be doing well. So that's, that's the dynamic in that industry. In general, for industries, any industries that are dependent on face-to-face -face interactions are not going to be doing well. So things like travel. Travel, public transport is not going to be doing well. Hotels are not going to be doing well. Cars are going to be doing all right because people want to want to travel in their own cars, but they'll be more reluctant to stay in hotels. They'll be you know, camping out, stuff like that. I mean, they'll be doing, spending some time in hotels, but much less than before, and especially public transport. So everything from airlines to bus companies, trains, whatever, not be doing well. Bars various inter in-person entertainment venues, movie theaters, or gyms will not be doing well. Retail, in-person retail establishments will generally not be doing well except grocery stores that they can provide online delivery. So online delivery is going to be much better. Uh, in-person activities will not be doing well. Things that provide people entertainment at home will be doing well. So various streaming services, various content creators, so that will be doing well. So those are things home improvement services will be doing well. So Home Depot will be kind of an exception to the rule of retailers not doing well because a lot of people will want some home improvement activities that they'll be ordering online. Some people will be coming in to get instructions, so all of that sort of stuff. So that's going to be the general dynamics in industries that you can think about going that way. Banks will be doing well in the medium term, I would say, but then they would be not doing as well because of the number of default rates default rates will definitely be shooting up. They already are. So banks will not be doing well. Insurance will be doing well because people are scared, they're afraid, and a lot of them are getting insurance because they're afraid. So that's kind of the kind of things, things that protect, that protect people will be doing well. Things that entertain people in person will not be doing well. Uh, Agnes Goldengay uh, asks, what was the last worldwide incident where these strategies had to be visited? Of course, the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis. That was a huge major fiscal crisis that really had these strategies, long-term impact, serious cuts had to be visited. Lisa Matthews asks about resources for virtual communication. Uh, yes, I can provide. A resource for that. So, uh, Lisa, this is a resource on virtual communication. It was published in the pandemic era, so it's specifically adapted to the needs of the pandemic. So that's something that you want to check out on effective virtual communication. And then I can also provide. Uh, Uh, 
And here is another resource on virtual collaboration, Lisa. So this is a resource on virtual collaboration, also published in the era of the pandemic, so specifically designed to address the pandemic. Those are two books that I can recommend. Let's see. Uh, Heidi uh, asks how to get a copy of my book. I will send that by email. So you don't need to do anything by that. I will send it by email using the same email that you registered with for Zoom. Do you, do you anticipate that this um, recession will be as bad as or worse or not as bad as the last one? Oh, definitely worse. There's no question it will be worse. It's going to be, it's be, because it's not a one-time event and then the shaking out of it through the fiscal system, but it's an ongoing, COVID-19 is an ongoing issue. It's not addressed yet. So if, if it was addressed already, then we could go into recovery, but it's not addressed. And this is making the situation much worse, the uncertainty ambiguity of what's going on and when we'll have a vaccine and the consequences is just going to be hitting us much worse than the previous recession. So it's definitely going to be worse, no question about it. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see what kind of questions. Gary asks, with uncertainty looming, how do we create a vision for a five-year strategy? You want to create a vision that's based on various scenarios. So you want to see where would you want to be in the five years and prepare for the moderate an ideally pessimistic scenario. So envision, if you have the resources for it, I would strongly envision, I would strongly encourage you to create a vision for a pessimistic scenario and see, okay, in a pessimist, let's assume a pessimistic scenario. Where are we going to be in five years if we still have not found an, a vaccine that's more effective than 50% for COVID-19? What will our finances look like? What will our organization look like? So that's what you want to do. Then if it's better news than that, you'll certainly be more prepared for the better news, that's great, but you want to, while hoping for the best, prepare for the worst. If you absolutely don't have the resources for that, I would at least orient toward the moderate scenario and say, okay, in five years, we'll have the vaccine by 2024, and so we'll then have a one year of recovery. Where will we be in that vision? So that's the kind of vision you want to structure. I strongly encourage you to not go for the optimistic one, but you want to have that vision for ideally the pessimistic one, at least the moderate scenario. So that's what you want to be doing, Gary, with the future scenarios. Oh, thank you, Stacey. I appreciate your kind words. Oh, Donna asked on taking information to the upper management. You want to share, you want to orient toward protecting them from bad news, from the negative future and say, hey, just got this information about how we can protect ourselves from a number of negative scenarios that are likely to play out for COVID-19. And so you want to present yourself as someone who is kind of a scout and a problem solver. So you don't want to present yourself as someone who is bringing them a problem, but you want to bring them a solution to a problem that already exists. They didn't know about it. You are highlighting that this, hey, we'll just realize the serious problem exists and here are ways of solving it. So let's talk about how to solve it restructure organization, make sure, restructure our strategic plan, make sure we're ready for this really difficult future, which we didn't realize was there, but it's definitely there, you know. <laughs> the truth will not be less true, even if, regardless of whether you want to believe in it or not. So you, you're presenting in them, this is the facts, and we want to be prepared for them. Now that we realize them, here are ways of preparing for them. So I hope that's helpful, Don. Mary, you're very welcome for expanding the horizon. This is difficult, I understand. Tony asks, how do you balance this message with the elected officials with what are coming out of the White House regarding COVID-19? So I guess I didn't want to get too much into politics, but you want to be pragmatic about this. I think we all understand that given it's an election year, the White House is painting a somewhat more rosy picture than is the reality of the situation. So given that it's painting a rosy picture and you are actually down there in the trenches, you can't afford to be rosy about this. You know, the White House is hoping for realistically more than the best. They're, you know, they're hoping for more than the best. They're kind of shading the numbers a little bit. So they are really not in a situation where you want to follow their guidance. 
you want to be realistic about this and protect your budget, your future from the reality of the consequences because it's on you, it's your responsibility. So you want to face the truth and solve these problems as they're going forward. And hoping for the best, planning for the worst should be the key motto, your key motto as a finance official, finance officer. Let's see. Debbie asked about specific examples of how to improve communication and where they have worked for others. Of course. So you want to, first of all, get people trained on using Zoom and other technology. As you can see, I've used Zoom. I hope you believe I use it effectively. So I use this polling to get information from you and engage with you about what we're doing. If this was a longer presentation, I would have used breakout rooms to get discussions and reporting out. I've used a new technology called Prezi Video that allows these slides that appear there while also seeing me. And I, I'm managing the conversation, engaging with everyone while doing the presentation. I'm even looking at the camera so you can see my face. These are basic things, but they're really important. And they provide a much more of a seamless video experience than it would otherwise. So that's something that you want to be thinking about, giving them even professional training on using Zoom. That's kind of basic making sure that they're not wearing uh, stuff that they're wearing, you know, right now I'm, I'm wearing business casual attire that I would be fine with presenting in the summer in an outside, in a setting, a professional setting. So you want to make sure that people are dressed professionally, all of that sort of stuff. You can look at my background and see that it's well set up for a good quality video presentation. I have plants, I have books, talking about myself, my personality, the messages I'm conveying to people. So all of these sorts of things are just about virtual communication. I'm looking at, uh, you want to help people read each other's tone of voice and read each other's what is being said and what is not being said. The same thing in emails. Think about lots of people when they send emails, don't think about their tone. So thinking about tonality is going to be really important. And how do you convey your tone? Because a lot of people, when they get an email, they'll tend to read it from someone who is being short with them. And, and it's kind of, you, do, you don't have those human touches and feelings. So you want to add those human touches and feelings, add that sense of humanity connection. And the same thing for body gestures. You know, you can't see my body gestures, but I'm gesturing with my face in a way that most people don't. And I'm exaggerating my gestures deliberately to convey information to you in a virtual setting because you can't see the rest of my body. So there are lots of, and these are just some examples of virtual communication that make it much more effective for people to hear me and absorb the information that I'm following, that I'm sending. Nora asked, and they definitely work well for others. So I've done some virtual communication training. I'm happy to talk to you about that in the free coaching session. So that's something I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, Alicia, yes, uh, talks about the collaboration software. There's Microsoft Teams, there's Slack, there's Google Suite, there's Trello, there's Asana, there's Mondays. I personally use Trello. I like it a lot. So in my company, the one I run, Disaster Avoidance Experts, we all use Trello for internal organization. It's a really good tool. So that's something I recommend, but there's a lot of benefits to using Microsoft Teams as a government software. Trello has, I think, um, as a small company, we can afford to do that. But Microsoft Teams, I think, is probably going to be um, well adapted for various compliance issue things that you might need to address as a government entity, for example. Question, within government, Given the need for continued public health response to the pandemic, might government public health be spared a bit from the coming cuts? I would love that, Mary, but I don't think it's going to be spared. I mean, it's just the reality of the situation. It's, it really depends on who is doing the cutting and how it's being cut. I think a lot of people in government office, in political positions, will not be really thoughtful about health care as a priority. That's, it's unfortunate and it's tragic, and you and I don't control that. So that is a, a, a rough situation. We need to deal with the hand that we're dealt. So what I'd love to spare government health from cuts. I think it's not going to be too much spared. Will we share the recording with participants? Sure, I can share the recording with participants. Agnes 
uh, asks, do you feel the fall election results will impact the current strategies you're recommending? I don't think they'll, rec they'll impact the strategies realistically. I think it, they won't impact the vaccine part of things being found because it's really much more on the corporate side. The only thing they'll impact is the production and distribution and vaccination. So I think with, if we do have the current administration in place, given that it's perhaps shading the numbers and facts a little bit, I think it will be more difficult to convince people to get the vaccine, whatever vaccine the current administration will approve if it, the current administration stays in power. So that will make the process of vaccination more difficult. That's an example of where, but that, that won't change things by more than a few months or kind of a certain percentage of people vaccinated. I don't think it will make much of a difference in terms of the timeline of vac vaccination. It, so that, that's the kind of things that I would think about in terms of the timeline, not, not really much of an impact. All right, it looks like everyone had questions answered. If uh, anyone has any more questions, please unmute yourself. I'll count to five in my head. <laughs> unmute yourself or chat in the chat and otherwise I'll assume that this were over. All right, thank you very much everyone. And I appreciate everyone who said their kind regards both in public and, and privately. And again, it's a difficult message, but it's something that's really important for you as government finance officers to integrate effectively into your organization. And I think you can do it. I'm confident that you can do it. You can change your strategic plans, your revise the structure of that's under your control in order to make sure that you are well prepared for this difficult future. Thank you, Dr. Gleb, and thank you everybody for attending. Everybody have a great day. Bye-bye. <laughs>